In this video, we're going to talk about precision modeling in Blender and how that compares to modeling in Fusion 360. Hey everyone, this is Matt with Learn Everything About Design, and in this video, I'm going to cover a question that's come in a few times about covering precision modeling in Blender. Now, this is something that I've avoided for a few different reasons. The first reason is that I just don't do precision modeling in Blender. For me, Blender is not for precision modeling. I would always go straight to a CAD package like Fusion 360 or something else. But a lot of people do use Blender for precision modeling for things like 3D printing because everything is gonna get turned into triangles anyways. And a lot of times the tessellations or the flat faces on curved surfaces don't really matter that much to them. But I do think that it's important to note that again, I don't do precision modeling in Blender. If you wanna learn precision modeling in Blender, there's actually a great channel called Maker's Tales, and I'm gonna put a link in the description. I have no association with Joshua there. Uh, I just think that he covers this topic really well and in depth because he uses Blender for this and I don't. So I'm gonna cover a few things, a few tips here. We're gonna talk about some of the tools we have access to, and we're gonna create the same object both in Blender and Fusion 360, and then you can make the decision. I know a lot of people, especially in the concept world, do not like Fusion 360 or CAD in general because they don't like the workflow of creating sketches and then creating features. However, in my mind, it's very similar to the edit and object mode in Blender, so I don't personally have a problem with that. However, there are lots of options. I've covered plasticity on this channel, which is in beta still. Uh, I have actually played around with Shaper and there's Moai and there's other programs out there. So if Fusion isn't the right choice for you, there's plenty of other ones that you can look into and pick up. But we're gonna get started by first deleting this cube. So I'm gonna select it, hit X and okay that. Now I do think it's important to note that I am not gonna go through every shortcut key or everything that we're doing here because I'm gonna assume if you're trying to do precision modeling in Blender that you are familiar with Blender. If you're not familiar with Blender, well then I certainly don't suggest you try this. So the first step for me if I'm trying to do something to scale is to go into my scene properties, go into units and make sure that the units are what I want. In this case, I wanna do millimeters. I'm also going to select the camera and the light and delete those as well because it's gonna kind of mess with the scale of the scene. So now that we've deleted the camera and the light and the starting cube, and I've changed my units to millimeters, we can get started modeling. Now, if you're in CAD, you would typically create sketches, then create your extrudes or your features. However, in a poly modeling program like Blender, especially when you're doing it without any add-ins, it's really not how it works. So we need to get started adding mesh objects. Now I do wanna make a quick note that we do have the option to add a Bezier circle which at its core seems like a true circle. You can see there are some tessellations here, but the problem is in order for us to use this to create a mesh body, we have to convert it and we're gonna run into the same problem that we're gonna run into whether it's a mesh body to start with. So I'm gonna delete that Bezier circle. We're gonna to go to add mesh and circle. And of course, if you're familiar with Blender, then you can just do shift and A and it'll bring up the same menu. Now. Before we do anything else, it's important that we understand that this add circle dialog at the bottom is only available when you first add this object. As soon as we do anything else, this goes away and we really don't have that same level of input or control. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna increase the number of vertices to 64. This is sort of a, a game of give and take with this because the higher number of vertices, it will look more like a true circle but it's just adds edges, it's going to add faces to our design. The lower number is going to be a bit easier in terms of just the number of vertices we're dealing with. However, if it's well below the resolution of say a 3D printer you're using, then it's just gonna be problematic because it's not gonna look very good. For this example, we're just gonna use 64, that's probably a bit on the low side still. And then the radius value that I wanna use for this first circle is 50. So I want a 100 millimeter diameter circle. We're gonna zoom in. I'm gonna left click and see the dialog go away. Next, we're gonna do the same thing. So I'm gonna add another circle. Again, this is right at the origin. Again, 64, this time I'm gonna increase the radius value to 100, making a 200 millimeter diameter circle. Both of these are still placed around the origin and the 3D cursor, which is exactly what I want. 
Next, I'm going to hold down the Shift key, select both, and duplicate them. For me, this is going to be Shift and D, and this creates a duplicate. I then I'm going to say Y to make sure it stays along the Y axis, and I'm going to say 300 on the keyboard, and that's going to move it to 300. Now, keep in mind that we can still change these if we want to, and that's really going to be the heart of how we do these precision models, is to make sure that we use things like transform to put things exactly where we want them. Now that we have all four of these circles on the screen, we need to join them together. So what I'm gonna do is select all of them and do Control and J. Control and J can also be found from the object menu under Join. And this is important to make sure that all objects are combined together into a single object, especially when we go into edit mode. Now that we have that, let's go ahead and navigate to edit mode, which of course is tab on the keyboard. From here, what we wanna do is we wanna get rid of vertices that we don't want. I'm gonna hold down Control since I'm on a PC, hit X and delete my vertices. I'll do the same thing over here, and you'll notice that I'm being very careful to keep the ones that are completely horizontal. We'll hit X and delete those vertices. Next, what we need to do is we need to join these vertices together. Now, when we do this, you'll notice that there are a couple things that we should understand. Right now, we don't have any mesh faces. So when we don't have mesh faces, what we actually need to do is we need to fill the distance between those two vertices. So F on the keyboard will fill the distance there. Now, if you try to select them and do something like merge or merge at center, what ends up happening is it stretches it out and it changes where that vertex was. This might be okay if you intended that to be your result, but ultimately what it's gonna do is it's going to create an extra crease in the model there. So I think it's important that we do use Control and J when we're trying to combine all these circles together. And then we're at the edit mode vertex level, we use F for fill. So now that we filled that, I can go to my edge selection and you can see all the vertices go away and this looks pretty good from where we're sitting. However, it's still not filled. We still have to fill it. So what I'm gonna do is go back to my vertex selection, hit all to select all and hit F to fill. Now you'll notice that automatically fills in these center sections and that's not what we want. So if we do control Z and we take a look at our options, we have a couple of different types of fill that we can do. Fill on, on this menu is Alt and F. If we do Alt and F, you can see that this is actually taking into account those center circles. However, that is a whole lot of vertices and that's not gonna help us when we solidify this thing. So with all of that selected, I'm gonna hit X on the keyboard and I'm gonna do a limited dissolve. Now limited dissolve will get rid of a lot of that. It'll clean it up, but you see there are still some edges left. We're gonna leave those edges for this example, but just note that it's important that we don't overdo it on the number of edges and vertices, especially at this stage. Now that we have this, I'm gonna hop out of edit mode. Again, tab will do that, and we're gonna go over to our modifiers. In order to turn this into a solid body, we could extrude it and fill the top and do all that. But in this case, I'm just gonna use the solidify modifier. Right now it's going 10 millimeters. We can increase or decrease that however much we want. For our example, I'm gonna to go to 50, and I'm gonna use this dropdown and apply it. Now, by applying it, I no longer have access to modify that. But if we hit tab, now we have this turned into this sort of, I'm gonna call it a solid body. The next thing that I wanna do is add another modifier, in this case, bevel. Now, if we just want a true bevel or chamfer, we can just leave it at that. We can modify the size, or we can increase the number of segments and turn this into more of a fillet. So I'm gonna reduce that to 100 millimeters. I'm gonna leave this at 16 segments, and you can see that it looks like a fillet, or if we change this to one, it's gonna turn it back into a chamfer or a bevel. So with this modifier, again, we can't apply it if we want to. As your models become more complex, it's gonna be harder for you to deal with these chamfers and these increased segment chamfers or bevels, and I'm just gonna call them a fillet. So this is the basic process of getting a precise model. Now, obviously this doesn't have the parametric nature that we have with a CAD program and any modifications we make if we go back in here is going to be problematic because now we have to move a bunch of vertices around. So it really takes a lot of planning and moving through the design in a very rigid way. 
But now that we have that, let's hop into Fusion 360 and we'll just take a quick look at doing the same thing. The units in Fusion 360 by default are metric, so I'm just gonna continue to work with that. In here, I'm gonna start a sketch, pick any plane we want, and I'm gonna create a circle. Remember, we had a 100 millimeter diameter and we had another one that was 200 millimeters. I'm gonna go ahead and just repeat that because it's pretty quick for me just to draw two over here. I'm gonna use my horizontal vertical constraint to make sure that those stay horizontal. And then my dimension tool, I'm going to put a 300 millimeter dimension here. Then equal constraints, I'm gonna go ahead and make those inside ones equal and the outside ones equal. And then my line tool between these two is gonna be tangent. And I'm just gonna make sure that tangency is applied everywhere in case it wasn't. And now I have a fully defined sketch. I can extrude this, select the regions of interest, go up 50 millimeters, and then I can apply my fillet or my chamfer. Now with this, I don't have to rotate anything. I can just make my selections pretty quick. And in this case, I'm gonna add a 10 millimeter chamfer. You can see that's a bit extreme. I think we did one inside of a blender, but you can see that, there we go, that's the end of the part. So obviously it was much quicker to do in Fusion, and one of the main benefits is that I can go back and I can modify these values. If I want this to be 200 millimeters, for example, the part still works. If I wanna change the chamfer to 10 millimeters, the part still works. If I wanna increase the size of the overall part, let's say 250, and I'm going to go ahead and make the inside of this one, maybe 75, make it a bit smaller and go up to 500 here. Finish the sketch and the part still works. So it's much easier just in terms of the modeling approach to do something like this in a CAD package. It doesn't have to be Fusion, but it can be any CAD package. And the second benefit is that we have a true B-rep or a boundary representation of that face. So it's a true arc, a true surface. We don't have a bunch of divisions as if it was a mesh body. Now, if we convert this to a mesh body, if we tessellate this thing, then we're gonna get essentially what Blender tried to do. You can see all of these lines and divisions between these triangles, a bunch of lines between the circles. And that's just, honestly, it's just not very good in terms of a precise model if your end goal is manufacture. Now, if you're gonna 3D print, it might be okay if you have enough edges. If you're gonna machine it or send it off to be laser cut or water jet or something like that, then Blender is just not gonna give you the output you need. So hopefully this gave you a little bit of insight on the differences between precision modeling in CAD, in this case Fusion 360, and precision modeling in Blender. Again, I'm gonna leave a link in the description down below to Maker's Tales. Again, I'm not associated with that channel at all. I just think if you want to do precision modeling in Blender, he has a lot of great resources already available. And again, I don't do that kind of modeling in Blender, so it's not something I plan on covering in depth. So make sure that you check that out if that's something you're interested in. As always, you can ask me questions, leave comments, but thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.